some abnormalities of the urinary system. One abnormality is something that we call cystitis. Yes. Sorry, just Emily. Back really quick. Um, I know this is kind of off topic, but. Does your anus also have an internal sphincter? The anus has an internal and external sphincter as well. When we get to the to the yeah. digestive system, we'll we'll talk about that. Okay. Unless you were talking about the plants, the planet doesn't. But <laughs> there is the planet, your anus, but that's not. So, never mind. Uh, uh, all right. So uh, cystitis, inflammation of the bladder. Right, inflammation of the bladder. Uh, it's 10 times more common in females than in males, and that's because the urethra is very short. In females, it's very easy for bacteria to move up that urethra and get into the bladder. Uh, when your, the cystitis occurs, there's usually also urethritis, uh, and when this happens, the generally female will experience a burning sensation upon uh, urination and urgency, the feeling that they need to urinate uh, frequently. Uh, sometimes it's called honeymooner syndrome because with increased frequency of intercourse, there's greater likelihood that bacteria will be pushed up that uh, urethra. Treatment, uh, if it's a severe infection, antibiotics are prescribed to kill the bacteria. Uh, cranberry juice is quite effective. It actually stops bacteria from adhering to the wall of the bladder. Uh, and women can also learn to urinate after intercourse to flush any bacteria out that uh, may be there. Glomerulonephritis, inflammation of the glomerulus and the nephron. A very serious condition because once the kidney becomes infected, that's what we're really talking about, the glomerulus and the nephron, right, uh, being infected with bacteria. Uh, the glomerulus, when it becomes inflamed, will begin to leak blood. So it's supposed to filter, and it won't be filtering now, it'll simply be leaking blood. So blood cells and proteins begin to show up in the urine. Uh, and of course this can be uh, deadly. Uh, treatment is uh, antibiotics. Renal calculi, commonly called kidney stones. Yes? How does the blood and the protein leak into the urine? Is it because of the capillaries? Like they're fenestrated, right? Right, so those fenestrations have gotten really big because they're so inflamed. Okay. Right, so it's really no different than if you get an infection in your skin and it turns red because there's increased blood flow and it starts to swell because the capillary pores have become inflamed. Uh, so kidney stones, if the urine becomes concentrated, stones can form uh, in the kidneys. Uh, if the stones then move out of the kidneys into the ureters, Remember, the ureters do peristaltic contractions, and so huge amounts of pain are produced uh, when this happens. The stones can be tiny, as shown here, but they can also be huge. This is the so-called, you don't even know, but they call it a staghorn stone. So here's a, uh, an x-ray of the kidneys, where, and you can see there's the renal pelvis, right? And there are the, cal the uh, calyces. Yes? So that, those are made up of salt, you're saying? Uh, no, these are usually calcium. calcium. Yeah, uh, calcium salts. Um, I got to watch my uncle pass a kidney stone when I was a kid. The same one that I told you about early on in the course, right? That that who had had the um, hydrostatic in increased pressure in the right um, hydrocephalus. Uh, so I, we were visiting, and uh, he started having lots of pain. Went to the doctor. In those days, I know it's hard to believe, but they didn't have what we call lithotripsy, where they could use ultrasound to break the stone. Uh, and so they simply sent him home with a, a little strainer to catch all of the urine. Uh, and I could see he was just in horrible, horrible pain. Uh, like I said, I was probably 9, 10, somewhere in there. And as much pain as he was in, I was thinking, they said a kidney stone, I thought maybe a marble would be coming out. Uh, when he finally passed the stone, it was just a little tiny thing, like one of these. I was really disappointed. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's it. Uh, these days, they can use lithotripsy. So they have ultrasound that they direct at the stones and they can fragment the stones. If that doesn't work, they can do uh, use an instrument called a cystoscope. So they go up the urethra, up through the bladder, up the ureter, and they try to crush and grab the stone. And if that doesn't work, they can do surgery to uh, remove the stone. Renal failure. If your kidneys fail, you have one to two weeks to live. 
uh, and you're really going to die because you are unable to uh, balance your electrolytes and acids and bases. So I think that typically people would say, oh yeah, you'll die because of waste buildup. Well, in a sense, I guess you could consider acids and electrolytes waste buildup, but not really, right? So if the critical part of this is that your kidneys regulate electrolytes and they also regulate uh, acids and, and bases. We don't want these people to die. Ideally, we would give them a kidney transplant, but there aren't enough organs to take care of the needs. And so dialysis is done. And those of you that have lab have a general idea of dialysis, but they will uh, take blood out, usually out of the person's arm, put it into a machine, a uh, dialysis machine that has selectively permeable membranes uh, with a dialysis solution around it. Uh, as the blood passes through there, waste products can diffuse out of the blood into the dialysis solution, and the blood that comes back will be cleaner than when it went. They're trying to kind of show that. Uh, because it's just cleaner and not clean, it usually entails many hours of sitting at the machine. Uh, so typically they'll go three or four times a week, maybe three or four hours each time. Uh, dialysis uh, labs are relatively common now. They didn't used to be whatever it's worth when I was a kid growing up. Again, I grew up in a farming community. The nearest dialysis machine was about an hour's drive away. Uh, and so I remember our community raising money to get a dialysis machine in our community because people that needed dialysis had to drive an hour, sit there for three or four hours, and come back for an hour. Uh, so when you're on dialysis, you're essentially tethered to the machine, right? You have to stay somewhere near where uh, a dialysis machine is located. Yes? Would they be able to have another lifespan on dialysis? Uh, you know, it's relatively nor normal uh, if you can consider the fact that you have to keep going back to the machine. The uh, machine is not doing as good a job as the kidney, but pretty close. So it's, it's relatively normal. Um, there are things that they have done to try to get away from using the machine. One of the things that can be done for some people is essentially uh, they make a hole in the upper portion of the abdomen, a lower portion of the abdomen, and the person has a dialysis bag that they drain constantly into the abdomen. It drains over the peritoneal uh, capillaries, and then they collect the dialysis solution at the bottom of the abdomen, and so they constantly change out the bags. Of course, they have to keep their wounds clean or they get an infection. More recently, they are trying to come up with a uh, implantable dialysis machine. They're getting actually pretty close uh, to where they will be able to implant the machine into the, the person. And the problem is that you're tethered to the machine, right? You can't go far away. Eric, did you have a question? Do you have to, do you have to take anything uh, when, when you're on the dialysis machine? Like uh, recount for like no, they're going to take reabsorb fine, but they will be on restricted diets because we don't want them to begin to build up things like creatine and other things that are, uh, for instance, uh, byproducts of protein digestion. All right, so this is.